So we have Jean and her PowerPoint both here at the ready. Welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Darby Love. I'm a librarian at Nanaimo North Branch in uh, Vancouver Island Regional Library. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional unceded territories of the Stonema and Stonanas First Nations. And if since we're not all under the same roof, you can put your nation or location in the chat. We'd love to hear that. And um, just take a moment to think about that for a sec. We'd also really like to extend our deep thanks to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners so Association. They've partnered partnered with the library on this program. And obviously we couldn't do it without you. You guys know all the stuff. Um, thank you so much to Joanne Canning. You can see her face at the top of my screen anyway, for uh, her key role in creating this programming. She's going to be answering your questions in the chat if they happen there. You can also put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom um, for Jane. So if, if Joe can't tackle your question, as it arises, you can definitely put it in the Q and A as well, um, just to because everybody always has so many awesome questions. We just like to get a few of them uh, solved as we go along to help you with your understanding of our gardening topics. And also a thanks to Richard Bernier who has taken on the coordinating role for the program this year. So uh, housekeeping items: we are recording the session today, so the only faces. Um, or names that will be recorded are us as the panelists. None of your folks' info is out there whatsoever. So as we said, please make you sure you use the Q&A feature and you can use a little bit of the chat feature too. The chat's kind of fun because people um, have different experiences that they can share and Joe can help, but we can definitely um, save them for Jane at the end too. The format will be Jane's presentation and then questions after. So we'll let her go uninterrupted um, until she's finished her part of the presentation. Okay, without further ado, Jane Kerr, an accomplished local master gardener, will guide us through the mystery of how a plant gets its name. What is the binomial system of nomenclature and how is it changing? So this presentation will have lots of fun facts about plants and their names. And Jane has found that researching plants bring her, brings her much joy, just as much as growing them. And her spirit remains optimistic despite some plant failures over these past years, mostly due to our crazy weather. As a young girl, she fondly recalls many happy visits to her grandfather's prairie garden, where she would cut flowers for her mom, pick crab apples for making jelly, or dig up some fresh potatoes and carrots for a meal. Many decades later, plants still provide Jane with a sense of well-being that nourish her body and soul. Jane is a past director of the Calgary and Comox Valley Horticultural Societies, and she's currently a director for the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association, as well as their North Island district planner and a mentor for interns at VIU. Thank you, Jane. You're welcome. <laughs> well, let's hope that my knowledge of plants um, extends better than my knowledge of technology. We had some struggles to get me on here today. Who knew that you had to update an, a Zoom app? Um, so um, without further ado, I do want to uh, talk about what's in a name. And this is a topic that I really enjoy because it's always fun for me to understand how did a plant get its name? Why is it named that? And what does it mean? And I'll have some great resources at the end of the presentation that you can uh, look to if you uh, get the bug just like I did. So what's in a name? So plant names often have identifying characteristics within their naming conventions. And these naming conventions are standard across every genus, no matter what the plant. And by looking at a plant's name, you'll know something about how a plant looks, it behaves, its origins, habits, or habitats. So, before we can do that, we sort of have to understand the basic naming conventions. So uh, it was brought uh, into the world in 1753 by Swedish naturalist Linnaeus. Uh, everything sort of plant and animal is named with the binomial system of nomenclature. Uh, human, we all know are homo sapiens. 
Same for plants, they get a genus and they get a specific epitaph. So let's just uh, get the technical educational side of things out, out of the way for a minute here first. So we have, I've decided to use a honey locust as my, um, my, my test case, because it's fun. So what we have here is we have the genus name, in this case, it's Cadicia. We have the specific epitaph being Trichanthos. Those two together make the species name. So basically, same as Homo sapien, this is Cadicia tri trichanthos. It has a designation or a form called a nermis. And a form is a grouping within the species that differs from the species in a recognizable way. So enormous in this case means in Latin, unarmed or deformed. And so trichanthos though in Latin means three-spined. So what we're saying is that this is a three-spined Gadicia, but it's unarmed or dethorned. And its cultivar name, which is always in uh, single quotes, is called sky coal. So that's kind of a fun way to say, well, what really is it? So they think what happened here is as plants get, well, it's not what we think, we know. Um, as plants grow and animals can't reach for them anymore, they grow less and less spines as they mature. And so they've taken some of these mature um, Gadicias and taken them from the top where they're actually unarmed or detorned. And they have actually done that tissue culture uh, or grafting, and they've got a new cultivar without the thorns. So that's kind of a fun, a fun way to, to look at it and to remember it. So, but we don't always know the specific epitaph of a, of a plant. If we don't, we call it an SPP. And there's means that there's multiple species within that naming convention, but their specific epitaph isn't known. And, and Narcissus is a perfect example of these, we have, or, or daffodils. We have lots and lots that we don't know, so we call them species and we just drive on. So, but sometimes a subspecies, and you will actually see it written as a subspecies, but never italicized, uh, is actually a naturally occurring geographically isolated variant population. So uh, the best way to describe that probably is um, the one side of the mountain gets all the rainfall, it gets lush, it gets uh, lots of, of uh, you know, good water. The other side of the, of the mountain range, it's very dry because it's dropped all its rain on the other side, it's windswept. And so you're going to end up getting very scrubby, very low to the ground, um, very different plants. DNA wise, they're the same, but they actually look and act very, very differently. So now we're ready for, I think, our first poll question of the day. Are a cultivar and a variety the same thing? And Darby, I'll turn that over to you. You're muted. Um, April, can you deploy the first poll question? Sorry. We'll let people think. Great. Okay, so I didn't put them in the way we intended to. <laughs> I'm seeing that. <laughs> That's okay. We maybe we maybe we can do it as a refresher at the end. Sure, we could do that. Recap our learning at the end. Why don't we do that? Okay. okay. <laughs> Hold that thought. We'll move on. <laughs> You'll know all the answers at the end. Well, be you can best. explain it now, and then we can retest people at the end. Exactly. Okay. So, the question was: Are a cultivar and a variety the same thing? The actual answer is no. And I don't know why my screen has frozen here and it's not moving. Whoops. There we go. No. Okay. Uh, cultivars and variety actually are very different things. A variety is a grouping within the species. It differs from the species in a recognizable way, but is not necessarily genetically different or geographically isolated. So that's, it, that's how it uh, varies from the previous slide. And a cultivar is actually achieved through human intervention, grafting tissues, uh, that type of thing, um, cuttings. Um, and so 
the word cultivar is actually a, a contraction of the name cultivated variety. So one is naturally occurring through nature and uh, basically sex in the wild, and the other one is through human uh, intervention. So in this case, we have a, an Ilex uh, verticillata variant vestigiate. So verticillata, you might think would actually mean vertical. It actually doesn't in this case. It actually means world. And, um, and so what happens here is that um, in this case, it, it's referring to the sessile fruits on this ilex, the world around the branch. And fastigiate in Latin means actually to go upwards and narrow up at the top. So we are seeing a world plant with the verticillata, and the variant is the fastigiate, fastigiate, and that means it's going upward. And so we see those, those are pretty common names that we see in plant naming. So that was why this was a good one to use. Okay, so now we also have uh, varieties and varieties are actually um, done, they typically used to be uh, with a CV in front. Uh, that's sort of old uh, way of thinking, if you will. They now are always just considered a cultivar, in fact, with their single quotes. And um, so over here, we have another uh, fastigiata. Uh, it's a Petula pendula, pendula, of course, meaning weeping in Latin. But now what we're seeing is we're seeing a weeping birch that actually branches upwards and narrows at the top. So it is the weeping form, but it's growing upwards. So uh, kind of fun. You'll see a lot of that kind of thing uh, in here. The other thing I want to mention is you're going to see a lot of these uh, Latin words often they're in the single quotes. If they're in the single quotes, it means they're a cultivar. But in 1959, the rules of nomenclature were changed and they no longer allow Latin in the, uh, in the cultivar name because it was getting too confusing. Uh, instead of, it needed to stay in that second spot or the specific epithet uh, where the pendula is uh, behind its name. So if you're seeing any Latin words in a single quote in a plant, you know it's older than 1959. So when is a plant name not a plant name? Well, um, so what's happening in today's world is some of the larger nurseries have realized that regardless of the, the valid cultivar name of the plant, they can come up with their own proprietary name uh, use it to market it, and they're promoting plants that actually already have valid cultivar names. And this is to sort of to convince the public that um, their name is actually the name of the plant. And um, it's a downward spiral because now they're starting to intentionally give these plants sort of nonsensical names. So the system of nomenclature is breaking down and that's, I think, very sad, which is one of the other reasons why I like to give this talk. Um, and so uh, what can we do about it? Well, here's a perfect example. This is what you people would probably all know as the rose, Peace Rose. Uh, it is actually a rose called Madame A. Melant. And it was coined back uh, to the Peace Rose by the Connard Pyle Nursery, uh, sort of to capitalize after the uh, post-World War II sentiment. It's become known as the Peace Rose. And, and this is how a plant can sort of change its name over time. Um, and yet it's a doing a real disservice to the nursery man that spent all the time and energy to, to actually develop this rose. And it deserves to be named by its proper or called by its proper name. So plant characteristics. So again, we often use Latin and naming conventions to define color, shape, leaves, origins, forms, or habitat and habits. So let's talk about a few of the colors. Very, very common. First one here is Alba. So we have the, uh, the uh, Lasonia inermis, again, inermis being dethorned. Alba in the left, named for its white flowers. In the middle, the Salix alban, named for the white underside of its leaves. And on the right, the popular populous alba, named for its bark. So in this case, alba is very descriptive as a color, depending on whether it's flowers, foliage, or bark. 
Aurea is another name that you'll often see. It actually means chartreuse. And so you will notice that uh, the middle part is what's kind of fun on this plant, um, on this slide. It says Sedum Hispanicum, it's a variant minus Aurea. Well, what the heck does that mean? Well, minus is actually, um, it's an anomaly. You can forget about it. So really what it means is minus is meaning minor. So what it's telling you is that this sedum hispanicum variant minus, very small flowers, they don't exist, they're, they're, they're minus. Over on the right-hand side, we have a Corydalis aurea wilt. Well, what the heck does that mean? Well, actually it's an accepted abbreviation for Carl Ludwig Wildenau, who is a German botanist who actually um, uh, discovered this particular uh, Corydalis and actually realized that it's actually part of the poppy family. And you can really see that in this case with the leaves, it is very similar to poppies in a lot of ways. So we have lots of words that mean yellow, flava, chrysis, luteus, crocus, and sulfurous. Um, and again, naming for the left with the physocarpets, it's the leaves, the cosmos, it's the flower. Uh, over on the right, it's the twigs. Now, as more and more plant DNA is being done, uh, this peony, lutea variant ludloi, used to always be considered a variant. Once they actually did DNA on this particular plant, they realized that it actually is its own genus and specific epitaph. It has now been renamed and reclassified uh, to its, it's no longer a variant, it is its own uh, species name. So um, lots of plants are changing classifications and um, even families at this point because they are uh, discovering where they belong DNA-wise, et cetera. Nigra, most of you would know, meaning black. Uh, in this case, you've got your uh, black mondo grass, and here you've got nigrescent, so you know it's an old cultivar, it's in single quotes. Uh, and, and again, you know, they've got lots of different endings on different uh, Latin names. You go to the root of the word and it just still always means nigra, which means black. Purpura, of course, meaning purple. Uh, I think these are all flowers, um, plants that you're probably all very familiar with. Um, I will note that the Digitalis purpura is actually on the BC invasive species list. Um, if you have it in your garden, enjoy it, but please pull it before it goes to seed. It is destroying our native ecosystems and uh, overtaking our native plants. And we're gonna skip our poll question, but it was what color does glauca mean when referring to a plant? In this case, glauca means blue or bluish gray. Uh, it can also refer to the fact that some plants have like a powdery white coda, coating on them, like called a bloom or a farina. Uh, and uh, it sort of has a gray coloring. And so sometimes it does refer to that. Um, again, we've got, um, uh, you might see the glauca name is glaucus, glaucum, glauca, uh, glauca, glaucum, and they all mean the same thing. It's just the root of the word. And I think these are, again, uh, pretty common plants for our area. I'm sure you've seen the shrub roses when you're out walking about. Now, rubra or rubens actually means ruddy red. And so on this side, we have uh, two old cultivars because we have rubra in the, in the uh, cultivar name. And then we have a lovely red sedge over on the right. And then we also have sanguinea. Now sanguinea means blood red or blood stained. And in this case, it's a form of red. I, I like to use this slide because um, I don't know about you guys, but none of these plants look red to me. Um, but that's how they're called. And, you know, we're going to go with it on this because uh, I've looked at these. I grow this this uh, hookera. It is not red. It's pink. It's deep fuchsia. <laughs> but anyway, we'll just, uh, it doesn't look blood stained to me, but, you know, we're going to go with it. Okay, so often, too, we name a plant for its form or its habit. So we're going to start off. We've already talked about this. Pendula, of course, meaning weeping. Um, 
Over on the left, we've got a European beech, a weeping European beech. And on the right, we have a Pinus strobus pendula. And um, strobus actually is translated from Greek as cone. So it's a conifer with a cone, so strobus. And um, this is a very old cultivar, 1866. And it's still one of the most popular pines that you can buy in North America today. Globosa, of course, meaning round. So we have the butterfly bush over on the left. We have the, uh, the Colorado blue spruce, the, the Picea pungens. It's named because it's actually kind of a round shape. The whole little tree is a round, fat little globy shape. And then, of course, the uh, amaranth on the right is uh, named for its round flowers. Contorta means twisted. Typically, when we see contorta, it's referring to a trunk formation, such as this uh, lodgepole pine on the left, and of course, the hairy lotter walking stick or the corkscrew hazel on the right. Uh, this, this is an uh, actual uh, mutant uh, from a European hazel, and it was actually found in a hedgerow in England in 1870, and it's still being cultiv uh, cultivated today. Uh, and it's a very popular plant. Now you can get it in red, you can get it in green. It's, uh, you love it or hate it. I happen to love it because of course I love to cut the branches and, and use them in my planters and for Christmas and stuff. And prostrata or reptans, meaning creeping actually in Latin. And so these plants tend to increase in size by creeping along the ground. They tend to be wider rather than higher in most cases. Uh, for those of you that are growing a juga, it is on the concerned plant list. It is uh, not, it's considered an ecological threat now, uh, on its way to becoming a named invasive plant. Nana means dwarf. Um, so a couple of slides back, I talked about the Pinus strobus. Uh, and now I'm, this is the same uh, species, in, uh, uh, but it is considered the Nana or the dwarf form of it. Um, and Nana, I need you to understand, is relative. If you're dealing with a plant that is 100 feet tall naturally, and the Nana is considered its dwarf and it's 50 feet tall, that's still a pretty big tree for today. So Nana is relative back to the original plant size. It doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's you know, a really dwarf plant. Um, you've got your uh, lovely little dwarf balsam fir to the right again still a very common plant today a great plant gracilis meaning graceful uh these are do this is a dutzia many of you would maybe be familiar with the dutzia strawberry fields cultivar it has the pink flowers these flower these branches sort of arch up and over plants very you love it or you hate it it's kind of floppy um very closely related to hydrangeas actually um, so I think if you like hydrangeas, you typically would like a dutzia. And again, the potentilla, a name for its very graceful little flowers. Maculata, meaning spotted. Um, so uh, I think I'd like to always show the spotted coral root orchid because it actually, it, it's, it, it does not have, it does not photosynthesize. So it doesn't, uh, it is, it's in a parasitic relationship with uh, fungal mycelium. So it e basically eats decaying uh, and dying organic matter uh, and it can't make it on its own. So um, it's kind of fun. Uh, of course, it's um, considered maculata because of the spotted um, spots on its labellum. And if you actually uh, looked at its uh, rhizomes from where it grows from in the ground, they're kind of swollen and they're kind of coral colored. So that's really kind of how it gets its name. It's a really funky plant. Anermus, we of course have talked about several times, being unarmed or dethorned. And so what you now have, we saw the, uh, the Lasonia anermus, the alba for the white flowers. Now you're actually seeing the, the actual um, species with the orangey red flowers. Procumbens. Uh, not to be confused with prostata, which is creeping, procumbens means to fall forward or to lean. And so um, I think, again, we're 
pretty familiar. These are pretty common um, uh, plants in our, our gardens today. Um, again, one of those, you, uh, you either love the Procumbens Norway spruce or, or you kind of hate it. I happen to think it's kind of fun. Um, have to grow one, have to have a little whimsy in your garden. Uh, where am I? Oh, back to fastigiate again. So we've already kind of talked about it. Uh, again, fastigiate meaning to narrow, to, to branch, to go upwards and to narrow up towards the top. So we also can name plants for origins or habitat. And a lot of plants are named for where they come from or for where they were first identified. So this is our first of the or third of the poll questions here. And it's what is the age of the oldest known tree in the world? So do you think it's less than 2000, more than 2000, more than 8,000? Well, I'm gonna give you a hint. It's more than 4,000 years old. This actually is uh, Methuselah. It is a great basin bristle, bristle cone pine. It lives in the White Mountains of Inyo County in California, along with lots of uh, other ancient trees. Its exact uh, location is kept secret from the public uh, because of vandalism. And based on the tree's age here, it's estimated that this tree germinated around 2832 BC. So it is older than the Egyptian pyramids and the US Forest Service confirmed that this tree is still alive as of October, 2022. So I don't have an update past that. So place, origins, habit, Japonica, meaning Japan. Uh, again, it's a place. Again, two of my most favorite plants, the Akubica japonica and the camellia. Um, I no longer have an Acuba because all the critters that live in my yard um, have decided it was a nice buffet. So um, for whatever reason, they really like this plant. Alpinus, meaning in the alpine. Uh, so uh, again, we have our Dianthus, the alpine pinks, and then we have our common uh, alpine asters. Um, you can often, they look very familiar with the fall asters. They all fall in that family. Uh, Dianthus are kind of fun, and we're going to talk about uh, them a little bit more in a few more slides. Virginiana. So I always thought, oh, yeah, it probably means from Virginia, which I don't know why I thought that. It actually doesn't mean that at all. It means it's from the Virgin Queen. It's a Greek word from the Greek word parthano, parthanos, meaning virgin. So I think. What it was, they were named for the very first time people had seen them. They'd never seen anything like them. They were virgin to them. Um, kind of a fun naming convention. Amur from the Amur River in Asia. Um, Adonis is, uh, they're an ephemeral. And ephemerals actually, they bloom and then they disappear underground for the rest of the year. And then they come back up the next year and bloom and disappear again. Uh, they're kind of fun to grow. I happen to really like them. Um, yeah, they're just kind of fun. Canadesis being, of course, native to Canada. So we have our uh, native uh, dwarf bunchberry. And then over on the right, we have the Sanguinaria canadesis, or the common name of bloodroot. Again, we know from our few slides back, the Sanguinaria means uh, blood red or blood stained. And actually, if you open up this plant, it just has copious amounts of sort of a yellow red sap, gets everywhere. It's kind of nasty, actually. California, being from California, um, pretty, pretty standard. Uh, two of our favorite plants that we get from there, the uh, Ceanothus, the California lilac, and the Fremontodendron, which uh, is pretty prevalent, both of these in our, in our landscapes here on Vancouver Island and Chinesis, and so uh, from China. And so we have the Alpinus pinks from the Alpine, <laughs> and then we have the China pinks, and they're very, very different plants. Though they look sort of very similar, they're very different. Um, these plants actually have different vascular bundles in their placenta and ovary wall. Um, the China pinks typically have white edgings on them or markings. <laughs> excuse me, and are very, very distinct, lots of different markings. If it's a sort of a plain um, pink, chances are good it's an alpine. 
sorry, not used to talking this much. <laughs> and then on the right, we have a, Shis a Shisandra. Um, again, I think this is a, a great plant. Uh, I don't think we grow it enough. So Shisandra is another plant. It used to be called the magnolia vine. Um, again, with DNA advances, it's now been reclassified into its own genus. So it's no longer considered part of the magnolia family. Montana meaning coming from the mountains. So um, Centuria Montana is actually on the invasive listed species list in BC. Uh, there's several other big head knapweeds that are on the invasive species list. Um, if you're not growing this in your garden, never grow it in your garden. No good can come from it. Um, if you are growing it in your garden, please try to get rid of it. It's going to take you several years. It's going to become your life's work. And um, they're just, it's not a good genus. It's, uh, it's a bully. It's a thug. Occidentalis, <laughs> meaning West or North America. So in this case, we're looking at a Thuga occidentalis, and its common name is Northern White Cedar. But this is actually not a cedar tree. It is actually a cypress tree. So how did this happen? Well, the, the British were not familiar. This was not a tree known to them before the colonization of um, the Americas. Uh, but they were familiar with cedar boxes that they used to get from the uh, from the uh, from the uh, Asia and, and the Orient. Uh, that so that these trees had a similar <coughs> sorry smell, and um, they had the flattened scales and uh, similar scent and texture. And so they ended up calling it the the Occidentalis cedar, meaning from the West. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and so then this error, of course, was carried to our North American colonies. Um, and it remains a source of confusion to this day. Um, I really try not to use the word cedar unless I'm dealing with what I know to be a cedar. Uh, the easiest way to probably tell a cypress tree and a cedar tree apart is cedars tend to look more like Christmas trees. Uh, the cypress trees can be uh, their branch, they're slender, more slender, their branches are more berry, that type of thing. But, you know, really they kind of act the same way. But so it is called a, a, a northern white cedar by common name, but it's a cypress tree. On the right, we have Plantanus occidentalis or the American sycamore tree. And this one also has a pretty funky history, which we're going to get into in a minute. So that leads us to poll question number four. Is the London plane tree a species? Well, the actual answer is no, it's not. So again, as you recall, we have Orientalis, meaning from the east, and we have Occidentalis, meaning from the west or North America. And so the original London plane tree was a cross between Plantanus Orientalis and Plantanus Occidentalis. And then they sort of thought, okay, well, we're going to call it Acerfolia because it kind of has the leaves of a maple. And then what happens is we actually have a third um, Platanus rasmosa, which is the Western sycamore. So uh, there's very, very, very few American sycamores left. Uh, they were mostly wiped out by a fungus. There are some Westerns, but this tree is um, fairly promiscuous. And so it likes to interbreed. And so now what's happened is we've got Plantanus rismosa and Plantanus um, crossed with Acerfolias. And now it's now called an intergressive hybrid. So now the two that are already crossed have crossed again. And now it's called Plantanus hispanica. Or is it? Well, you know what? The panel is out, apparently. This is a hotly debated topic in the London Plain world. Who knew? So uh, you may see it written uh, one way. You may see it written another way. And we're really not sure whether it's probably from the Rasmosa or it's from the Occidentalis. It could be either. So this is, uh, they're calling them all London Plain trees. 
but uh, we're not really sure what their parentage is any longer. Siberica, meaning Siberia, of course, two very common plants in our gardens, uh, the iris and the uh, Siberian uh, dogwood. You may think that this actually is our red twig dogwood, but it's very similar. Uh, this particular um, dogwood is not as aggressive as the uh, our, our red twig dogwood, and it's named Tatarian dogwood from the Turkish ethnic group that probably was the ones that found this along the Silk Road on, in Asia. And so uh, that's why they were called taters. Uh, that was the name of their peoples, this Turkish eth ethnic group. And that's why it's called a Tatarian dogwood today. Silvestris, meaning woodland habitat. And so over here on the left, I've put a P period Silvestris. So if you were, talking about a plant and then again if then in the same um, sort of bulletin or whatever that you're talking about you you name it again you don't have to write out the whole genus name you just can put the capital P in the period uh, it's a very acceptable way to write it uh, again we have tulips uh, the woodland tulip here uh, we tend to also call them species tulips often that's not really correct in this case this is a named uh, uh, a named uh, tulip. And often too, we name them for leaves. Uh, so leaves can be very, very distinctive when looking at plants and they tell us a lot about the plant. So the first one is going to be dentata, meaning toothed or sharp toothed. Again, two pretty common plants in our gardens, uh, the ligularia and the hellebores. And you can see they're very, uh, little toothy edges on their on their leaves and that's what they're named for. Palmatum meaning palm shaped or palm sized. So we have our acer palmatum, very common Japanese maple in these parts. And we have some Chinese rhubarb, which is the room palmatum. Uh, if you've never grown a Chinese rhubarb and you got a little extra room, it's a really fun plant to grow. Millifolium, meaning thousand leaves. Uh, I think we're all pretty familiar with yarrow. Uh, on the right is a not very common plant. I really wish it was be growing more. It's native to Oregon and pronouncing it is actually kind of fun. It's pronounced Kame Bay Ta Riot. And it is uh, native or naturalized to Oregon. Uh, if you've got more of sort of a, of a woodland naturalized garden, this might be one plant to, uh, to uh, uh, check out. I think you can get it at Streamside Nurseries in Bowser. Undulatum meaning wavy. You can tell from our trillium we have wavy leaves and we have the bravascum on the right. Placatum meaning pleated. Uh, very, very common um, plant. Any of the viburnums, they're, they're instantly recognizable. You may not know their specific epitaph or exactly what they are, but you're gonna know they're in the genus Viburnum because every one of their leaves looks like this. It's deeply, deeply pleated. Uh, it's just a characteristic of all Viburnums. Mollus meaning very soft. Often if you have a kid's garden and you're looking for, for uh, some tactile plants to use, uh, ladies' mantle and bear's breeches are two that uh, the kids are really fascinated by. And of course, you know, uh, they love to see the little water droplets on them and they're very soft and fuzzy. Crispa or crispum, meaning curly. So uh, in this case, this is the, uh, the spirea has curly leaves on the crispus, but um, on the left. And on the right is a Clematis crispa. Now you should never see this plant. I was at a plant sale a few years ago and somebody brought this plant in. I, we, we had a hot debate about it and it was, uh, it's a very toxic plant. You'll never see it in a retail sale. Um, it's not a, it's one of the bad, there's very few bad Clematises, but this is one of them. It's the bad, the black sheep of the family. So the question is, are all succulents cacti? And I actually wrote this down. I meant to do it the other way. Are all cacti succulents? And I had a little blonde moment, but that's okay. These things happen in life. We'll leave it at are all succulents cacti. So on the left, we have um, Euphorbia, Cristatha, 
curly euphorbia, crestata uh, meaning crested, plumed, tufted, or comb-like, like a comb on your head or a helmet. Uh, so you can see uh, the crested root grass, sort of like a comb on the right, and the um, the euphorbia, the curly euphorbia on the left. Um, it actually looks like a cactus, doesn't it? But it's actually a succulent. So all cacti are succulents, but not all succulents are cacti. And all euphorbias, I don't care which kind they are, they do have some toxic elements to them. Typically they're sap. And sometimes <clears throat> plants are named from roots of words. And so we sort of think, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. So folius or folium, meaning foliage or leaves. This is uh, probably Caladium freckles, a really fun uh, plant. Um, not really that hardy here, unless you have a greenhouse, which I don't have. Macro, of course, meaning large. So large flowers are on the left, the large uh, variety of the uh, geranium. Micro, of course, meaning small. Uh, again, you would see the microfella uh, in the uh, left hand side, meaning it's got to be a very old cultivar because it is uh, in the cultivar name. Poly, meaning, meaning many in Latin. Um, so the euphorbia polychroma means too many flowers to count. Uh, the Japanese tassel fern, the polystichum, polyblepharum on the right. Oh boy, that's a big word. Uh, it actually, the um, poly in, uh, in um, it, it means, of course, many. And uh, blepharum means, it translates to many eyelashes. And so this refers to all the like the little bristles on the stipe and the ratchies on the parts of the stems of the, of the fern. So what it translates to is uh, many eyelashes is actually what it uh, is saying. And multi being um, many and flora, of course, being feminine or the goddess of flowers in, in Latin. So uh, this is a rambler rose thing. It's a goddess of all flowers. Vulgar meaning very common, uh, nothing special about it, very common. And we've talked about trichanthos previously, again, meaning three-spined. And officialis, it means medical or uh, cooking usage, typically uh, when naming a plant. So two very common plants here, rosemary and ginger, uh, both with the names officialis or officianelle in the name of the ginger. And sometimes they're named for no other reason but for the person that actually found them and uh, cataloged them. So here's two examples of uh, Fortunii, which was, uh, they refer to the Scottish botanist and plant explorer, Robert Fortune. Uh, so mean nothing to do with the plant, just who actually ended up finding and cataloging it. Uh, David I. Uh, named after Armand Davis, who was a 19th century Catholic missionary. Uh, he was an avid collector of plant and animal specimens in China. He has over 100 plant species credited to him. So you see David I, there's nothing in common to the plants other than this priest actually found them. Sebaldi, same thing, or Sebaldii, I guess sometimes it's said. And that's uh, from German doctor Philip Franz von so Seibold. Um, one of our most magnificent uh, magnolias is, of course, credited to him. So that is the end of my presentation. Now, if you are now all excited about Latin names and want to know more, uh, here's a couple of really good um, Latin uh, dictionaries. The Iowa State University has one, and as does the Missouri Botanical Garden. Uh, so um, they're very great to look up and kind of fun just to look through. I've given you just a teaser. There's literally hundreds of names in Latin in here uh, that relate to plants, but I kind of wanted to stay to the, the more common ones that you actually see. So that's it for my presentation. I I hope you learned something. And when you look at a plant name, you think, oh, that's so cool. Or thinking, oh, that was really boring. So whatever. <laughs>
and that's it. Well, thank you so much, Jane. Um, as uh, many of us uh, master gardeners know, we're always using the Latin name, and yet I'm always having to remind myself sometimes of what they really mean. And so it's been a great refresher for us for me. Thank you. The other thing is knowing the Latin name definitely does help because you can have two plants which are the same, but grown, let's say one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, and they call them different plants. So there's a lot of regional uh, terminology in plant uh, common names. Yeah, that's, that's quite true. And when I worked uh, for a herbal company, uh, those regional names often um, created problems because people wanted to use the regional name uh, rather than the Latin name. And uh, I had one gal who from Quebec who um, wanted uh, Herbe de Saint-Jean. And she said, oh, well, you know, that's St. John's wort. And I said, no, no, that's milfoil. And that is has exactly the opposite effect of what the English call um, St. John's wort. And uh, so knowing that Latin name, as you say, Richard, is really, really important. <laughs> Definitely. Do we have any other questions from uh, our? There's members? one Q&A from Lisa. She says, when a plant is named uh, Chinesis Korea, was it found in China or in Korea? It's a, it's a plant that you'll find in both places. If yeah. it's called chinensis, it's often um, found in China, but that particular plant um, grew in Korea um, as well. And so if it's been domesticated and it's one of the plants that we use, um, it's being differentiated very deliberately. Um, and uh, that's where you'd get both of those names. And so apologies, because I pronunciation is not something I know how to do on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any other um, specific knowledge about about that with the with the Shinensis uh, um, Korea? Because usually, um, if it's only from found in that one region, you'll only have the one name. Well, and a lot of times Korea is the cultivar name. So I'm wondering if they're missing the specific epitaph to that because it's not coming up on anything I'm looking at. So, oh, okay. um, so often that might be the problem. I often have, I do occasionally see Korea as a cultivar name. So ah, okay. Okay, that so might talking, be what's going on. So you're talking, Jane, about like like right, what you were saying before, where like nurseries, et cetera, are not labeling the plants correctly. And this is becoming a really big problem. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't know exactly, um, and, and if you only and if you don't know the cultivar name and it is a cultivated variety, and you go and get something and you're going, Well, that's not what I wanted. Well. That's because it's integral to that entire um, plant because each cultivar reacts and, and does different things, right? So um, it, that's why the name is, you know, almost a three-parter, if you will. It's the, the binomial nomenclature, the, ge the, the uh, genus name, the, speci the specific epithet, and its cultivar name if it's a cultivated plant, yeah. And, and don't you find too, Jane, that often where we have a, a species of plant that has both annuals and perennials in it, that you'll run a muck um, or run a ground, if you will, in a garden center because yeah. they won't differentiate. And, no, they uh, don't. In fact, I just I was up at Garden Works in Courtney not too long ago, and they actually are labeling their petunias petunia hybrids. That's their only labeling, and wow. I was horrified. Yeah, yeah. horrified. And, and yet you'll you know. See Really? You'll, yeah. <laughs> That's all you'll you got. See, you'll <laughs> see in Europe, they will say, um, say if they're in a particular climate zone, they will say perennial grown as an annual. Um, yeah. But here they will just say annual. Um, yes. 
when it's only out of zone. And if you take it in into the uh, garage for the for the winter, it does just fine. And it really yes. uh, um, it can be very frustrating that way. You, you've actually hit on a really good thing that's off topic, but I think it's worth noting. Um, the plants are labeled if they do have a zone on them. They're labeled for where they were growing. So if they were growing down in Oregon or somewhere else, they may be a zone different from where we are. Uh, so you have to understand where that plant was growing because that's where it's tagged for the zone it belongs to. And I'm noticing nurseries, uh, especially where I am, uh, they're bringing in more and more plants that really aren't hardy here. Yes. Yeah, Costco is a really bad one for that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Even within a species or uh, you have some plants that are more hardier than others, like um, let's say uh, the common um, Mediterranean palm, right, which is Camerops humilis. Well, there is also Camerops humilis serifera, which just means it has um, a bluey gray leaf. But one is hardy here, the other one not quite as hardy because it doesn't tolerate wet. Right. right. So you have to cover it. There's a question here. Um, how is the word kinkafoil pronounced? That's it, kinkafoil. Um, I, uh, I could be wrong, but uh, I've always heard the, the C as hard. Has anyone else heard it pronounced any other way? Like sinkafoil, I've always heard it with the K. So. Well, I've 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 heard it both sinkafoil or um, sinkafoil. There's yeah. a great app on Google. Let me just look it up here. Um, I should have had this at my fingertips. I apologize. We had some really nice um, comments in the chat about the importance of knowing uh, scientific names when foraging in particular. Definitely. Something can be poisonous yeah. one place and not another place. And if you're trying to eat it, that's kind of important. <laughs> so if you're actually wanting to look, there's many different apps up I'm looking and I've just put in verbal pronunciation of Synthla and uh, it there's, four that are coming up and they'll actually give you the verbal um the, you mean the audio on it the audio on it yeah yeah okay so it's just just book. just do uh, the yeah. other thing i would suggest is if you are going to a nursery and you're buying a plant that you don't really know much about take out your phone and actually research it before you ever buy it because it may not be hardy it may have uh, too much of a growth uh, that's the other thing i should mention is that the size on plants are actually at their 10 year maturity. And so plants don't all of a sudden get to be 10 years old and go, oh, I better stop growing because I'm past the size of my tag now. Uh, that does not happen. They keep going. And so if you're already looking at a plant that's going, well, you know, it's going to be eight feet. Well, I only really have six. You're already looking to plant it in the wrong place. It's going to keep growing. It's just that its growth is going to slow down. So remember that it's a 10 year maturity and often in BC, it's even faster than that. It's more like about eight years because of our growth. I see there's a question on Google Lens. I myself use Google Lens occasionally. It's good for the families, but as far as let's say looking up cultivars and like that, no, yeah. it'll just give you the general uh, Latin name and that's about it. I actually, buy a subscription, it's called Picture This, and I also buy Plant Snap. So um, I'm used, I use both. Uh, interestingly enough, I think I'm starting, I used to like uh, Plant Snap better. I'm now liking Picture This better. They've gotten a lot better with their identification. I think the subscription's $39.99 a year. For me, it's worth it. For other people, it may not be, but you know, that's, I just I just snap everything just for fun to see what it shows me. So it sounds like you know that it, those apps, at least if they're not correct, they point you potentially in the right direction. Or oh, absolutely not. Anyway, <laughs> so it's still not what it is. You know, it, they're good, 
but in, it is only about how good the picture is that we take and we don't always have a great picture to take um, or uh, the, you know, there might be other things around it or it, it's just unden unidentifiable at that stage in its life. I mean, typically the best thing that you can have is flowers on a, on a plant because that'll give us that usually the apps don't mess that up. But if it's just leaves and foliage, they can mess it up. Yeah. Um, a question from uh, Robert Yontz, um, Jane. Um, he's asking if you could go back over when the single quotes are used. Yes. So single quotes are a cultivated variety, uh, which means that they've had human intervention. They've been grafted tissue, tissue, uh, tissues, um, or just dividing. That's how they've gotten it. And so if it is in single quotes, it will always have, it's, it's been human intervention. It hasn't been something that's happened naturally in the wild. And uh, Doug um, Lynn um, wanted you to spell the uh, app out for the plant ID. Um, is it plantsnap.com? Oh. No, well, you just go into your app store and look for plants snap. Like, like snapping your fingers? Yeah, yes. snap. Yeah. yeah. Or picture this. Yeah. And I and I think Amanda Henderson just gave uh gave one to us as well. www.plantsnap.com. And also picture this. So I hope I hope that uh, that helps, Doug. Somebody uh Jan Dwyer is talking about uh watching for invasive plants. Now, not all plants are invasive in all climate zones. If the plant comes from a climate zone that it's used to living in a desert, well, of course, it's not going to grow very well here. Uh, but providing you put it, if you put it in a desert and give it a lot of water, it can become invasive. It's like periwinkle here. People grow it on the prairies and everywhere else, but here it's an invasive species. Uh, it's like uh, English ivy. Right, so it's always a good idea when you're looking at plants to look at the government and let them tell you what they figure is invasive in your region. Basically, so the best plant, the best place I go, I go to the BC Invasive Species Council. Right. And well, was, and I'm sure there's lots of other areas as well. I mean, there are, got, but that one has got, everything plant and animal, oh, and it yeah. also gives you yeah. alert species and ecological threats. And I so, think, it's a, think, and, and other areas. I mean, we've got we've got website. folks here from Boston and Chicago exactly. and Florida so talk and to the local Canada governments and Tucson oh. and and uh, <laughs> okay, um, not good here. <laughs> <laughs> well, one one really great place that I go to when I'm when I'm trying to find a lot of data is um, the extension programs in the American universities. That's Their right. extension programs have just the most amazing information. And um, many uh, states, for instance, Colorado uh, has a very, very good invasive plants uh, council. And so I'm sure um, our American uh, cousins um, can go to their state facilities and find as well. Um, we have someone from um, the UK, um, perhaps, and I didn't write your name down. Um, can you tell me how they deal uh, with it um, in the uh, in the UK um, and also um, in the Netherlands? Um, is it a nationwide or is it a district wide um, uh, program that you have? Uh, you probably have to put the answer in the chat. And while we're waiting, the Missouri Botanical Garden is very, very good as well. It's oh, that's, my, that's remarkable. And that's in the States, and it's one of my go-tos. And it, it'll usually break it down by region for you. I find, yeah, I find Missouri um, is very um, careful about that, yeah. that you can get a lot of information out of, um, um, out of that, out of Missouri, that will talk about different uh, different zones and and uh, different soils and whatnot. The same with the University of uh, uh, Oregon; they're very good that way. There's somebody else who's talking about 
uh, some of the uh, like foxgloves and ro the rocket and California poppies. These are, I wouldn't really call them invasive because they won't grow everywhere. They, they need a certain climate to be able to grow fairly well. Like they like the summer drought and this kind of stuff. So you may find them uh, on the side of a road or something, but you're not gonna find it in the middle of a forest because the forest is not, an invasive is something that displaces other plants, right? That takes over. And uh, like I said, California poppies, you find them all over the place, but are they really truly invasive? They're, I think they're more what we call rampant. You have yeah. vigorous, rampant and invasive. And uh, um, as you say, Richard, the, the invasive ones are um, the plants from hell. And um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, and sorry <laughs> from the Netherlands says that it's a nationwide program for invasive species in the Netherlands. We get so many of our uh, plants from both the UK and the Netherlands. And uh, so it's always good to know. And our Australian friend says here in Australia, we have local biosecurity. Um, okay, right. Yeah, um, that covers invasive uh, of flora and fauna, but also state and national departments, but they're mainly for import and export. So that's, that's uh, very much like Canada. Yeah, here on the island, we have blackberries, Himalayan blackberries that are quite invasive. We have English ivy, we have scotch broom. These are all uh, plants that take over the, the habitat and kick, uh, don't allow some of the more native plants to grow. And but someone here, just- uh, But here on the island only, the, the, um, the blackberries are not considered invasive. And the reason, the, though they are, the reason they're not a listed invasive is because they're actually naturalized to this region. So that's yeah. the other key component. It has to be, if it's naturalized to the region, it it does uh, it does not hit the invasive <coughs> list, even though so most of us would just naturalized. hate it. I mean, I just came back from a, a trip in France, actually, and I was going through vineyards and they were lamenting the Scotch broom. <laughs> it is everywhere in France. I'm like, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, it's all over the island. So it's everywhere. And one, <laughs> and one of our original uh, uh, master gardeners, Joan Rich, is from uh, Scotland. And she said, that's OK. You guys got back at us. We uh, we hack our way through rhododendrons in Scotland. <laughs> we gave you broom, and you gave us rhododendrons. I think and I'd rather have the rhodos myself, personally. <laughs> Can you imagine rhododendrons being invasive? Um, yeah, uh, Japanese knotwood um, is uh, seriously invasive on the BC coast um, because it uh, displaces the natural um, streamside plants. Um, and those streamside plants attract all the little bugs that the trout eat. And so uh, the Japanese knotweed actually not only displaces the plants, but starves the fish because there's no food. Um, and it is uh, actively removed um, by um, the local uh, uh, invasive species folks. As I said, no good comes from any centuria plant. <laughs> would, would one of you mind explaining for everybody like a little bit more about what naturalized means? Like you're talking about the blackberries being naturalized. Like, they you want to handle that, Joe? Or? Yeah. Um, when when a plant has become uh, become naturalized, like the Himalayan, um, it does in certain areas displace the natural plants. So uh, you'll have a hillside of uh, Himalayan blackberries that was once Nutka roads. Um, you'll have other areas. Um, in, in which it is simply very vigorous and is easily controlled. In the Sominos Marsh, just north of Duncan, um, which is a world uh, um, conservation site, they leave the uh, Himalayan blackberry. So it doesn't overtake many of the other plants, but because it's so um, 
uh, vigorous, it produces more food in a small area. And so it, become, it has become a very important food plant for the migratory birds um, because the marsh has been crowded. And so there is a, a useful plant. And um, I don't know about you, but blackberry wine is wonderful stuff. Um, so it, it has become naturalized. It doesn't mean it's not troublesome um, and that it's not useful, but it does need some serious control where you have other naturalized species, um, both plants and um, animals um, that will actually fill a niche in a, a, a climate zone or a bioclimactic zone um, that was empty. And our California quail here on Vancouver Island are an example of that. Um, the quail we have live at a higher altitude and the California quail moved in and their populations are very stable and the um, hawks and whatnot, because they look like other grouse, recognize them as food. So it controls the, the uh, population. And the dandelion that was introduced by um, the pilgrims uh, to the Northeast of the States has now, is now completely naturalized um, all over North America. And it can be pesty, but it's not invasive. Uh, and so that's, that's the difference there. Um, and of course they introduced it because it was medicinal and um, it makes good wine too. Uh, and um, uh, is also used as a salad green in spring. So that's the, that's the story with, with naturalized plants. It yeah, also provides- to, to uh, sort of remember it is they've essentially been adopted by their new homeland. Right, that's and it does, <laughs> it does fulfill a niche in the environment protects, uh, you give the the quails somewhere to hide basically from the hawks and everything else. From, from well, the and hawks. rabbits and, 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 and the, you know. The rabbits. Yeah, and we have a very large PTSD. rabbit warren down below and yeah, they're, they're living nicely within the blackberries, trust me. <laughs> so we have a question about California poppies. If you don't want them to spread, cut off the flowers after they bloom. Yeah. Because they will, they will seed them. They they reseed um, vigorously and will overwinter. The seed will overwinter as well. Yeah, let them flower, but then just cut off the seed pod when it's still green. Yeah. So much of it's about control. I have lots and lots of dandelions, but they're a great early spring pollinator, and I have a special dust buster that as soon as they come to puff balls, out I go and I suck up all the seeds <laughs> so that they're oh, not spreading anywhere. My husband just looks at me and he goes, I, I don't even want to know. Like I, I just, we all we all you know have what? such that way oh. the bees get it every year, but they're not they're not going anywhere. I get them before they break apart and uh it, uh, it's a five minute job for me to clean up 70 or 80 dandelions. What a great idea. Cause I always, <laughs> I always just snap them off. And um, the fellow who uh, taught me beekeeping uh, uh, told the class that they are the single um, most uh, um, important source of pollen uh, for the wild bees um, when they're in bloom. And as you know, often they're the only thing blooming. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, yeah. And so the dandelions said, have their place, and I have a lot of them ocean side. I live next, I live on the ocean, um, but I don't let them spread into grass or gardens or anything. But as soon as they sort of start their little puffy ball phase, they're they're gone. But they've they've been there so long now. My dandelions are about the size of an orange. Um, and um, someone said uh, we're talking about a vigorous, rampant, and invasive, and those words are not invasive categories. The only invasive one is, as Richard said, it's invasive. It creates an ecological problem like the knotweed on the streams. It displaces and can uh, destroy, in many cases, um, the native plant. I watched a 200 foot cedar tree 
over the space of about five years get killed by English ivy. That's invasive. Something that's vigorous is just like that. You know, um, she's she's a big bone gal. She's you know uh, that's that's vigorous. Rampant is um, just that. It's going to outgrow where you are, and again, that depends where you are. So, but invasive is very specific. It's it's like giant hogweed around stream edges. Yes. which is definitely a, pro a problem here on the island. But anywhere else, it's not invasive. It has, it likes that climatic, that wet area. So it'll only grow there, but it won't grow in your yard or anything else. So you've, that's an invasive specific to the stream edge. Right, right. Um, and here, uh, uh, Jillian says, my dad taught taught me to burn the dandelion puffs with a lighter. <laughs> oh, even Which better, we, but it's dry here. I'd probably start yeah. the whole bloody island. <laughs> start start, uh, they start don't a bloody brush to, fire. Right? <laughs> it's been pretty well, just about five weeks without any appreciable rain here on Vancouver Island. So it's pretty dry. It is. I've watched the uh, um, ambient uh, humidity drop from 85 to 70. And this morning, when I got up at about 530, it was 48. Yeah. Right. So that's it's it's really dropping now. So we're hoping to get get a bit of uh, um, of rain soon. Do we have any no, more questions from it. our uh, people watching this? I have one more question for Jane because I don't see any more questions. How did you get so into naming conventions? I think just because I, I think it was really during COVID and uh, like everybody else, I didn't have a whole heck of a lot to do. And there weren't any plants that were any fun to buy at the nurseries because everybody in the, decided to take up gardening over COVID. And so there was nothing fun, nothing for me to sort of though it's different and new and like I quite like to go to nurseries and see what's new this year you know what what are they trying to you know pawn off on us now and you know it actually takes about 15 or 20 years for a new plant to come to market really and they really haven't recovered the nursery trade from the the financial downturn in about 2008 or 9 so we're still not seeing a whole bunch of new plants come on the market that uh, we haven't seen before. We're seeing some coming from different areas that are not hardy here, but that's the you know different thing. So I had something, you know, I needed something to do. So that was so and, I, or, and I boredom being the you know the mother of invention, <laughs> I guess. So that's kind of how I decided started I'm just staying. gonna start researching my plants. And it, and as master gardeners were taught to to use the scientific name. And it's interesting because when I lived in the UK in England. Um, you never spoke to a gardener um, that didn't use the scientific name. Now, mind you, that was 50 years ago. Um, it may have gone the way of North America, but um, you, you, you spoke to a knowledgeable gardener and they would always use the scientific name. They may follow it with the common name. And mm -hmm. that's what what I try to do when we're in clinics, if someone asks a question, I'll, I'll say scientific name and, and then the common name. And Jane, uh, we have a question on SPP species, uh, the cross and oh, yeah. SP. Not really any difference. They're both no, species. The, yeah, the one, the cross though, is when you're doing a line cross between to specific uh, plants and you're wanting to actually get uh, a slightly different color or a slightly different leaf form or maybe something a little hardier like Hamamelis mollus uh, is a cross with the Hamamelis chinensis. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the intermediate. Yeah, but those are still, yeah. the, the new name would still be a cultivar name, right? No, yeah. there's, no. Well, not always. Intermedia, uh, Hamamelis intermedia 
is actually a cross between the Shinensis and the Malas. Well, yeah. then it would be written, um, as I showed the one, it would be written with the cross in the middle of, between the two species names. It is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, often but our cultivars are, are developed by doing these crosses and then it just gets a new cultivar name, right? Right. And sometimes it's actually between two species that are very closely related. That's right. Hookeras and hookerillas. Right. Yeah. Or like yeah. the Hamamaeus mollus and the Hamamaeus chinensis. Yeah. So, and oh yeah, I there's no there's no end of promiscuity within the plant world. <laughs> let me assure you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Jane, my understanding with the SPP and the SP, um, and correct me because you're more up on this than I am, um, I, uh, um, I was taught that the species name, and then they go SPP, um, just says this is the genus and there are several species. That's um, right. But, it, but if they're referring to a specific plant, um, you've got the genus name and then this and then the SP, which means that one species. Is that correct? Actually, that is true. But if they can typically know the name of the specific epitaph, then they give it. Yeah, right. Right. Um, right. So the, these are the this is sort of a, an area that is we're changing some of our naming conventions. If you know, if you're noticing like variety yes. very, you don't see variety very often you don't see form anymore those those were sort of the, the, it's it's changing language is what it's doing yeah yeah that's true doug doug asks about the dandelion um are the flower petals the only edible part no in fact dandelion root was often what it was grown for. Um, it's um, very uh, important uh, in herbalism for liver ailments. And um, dandelion root is also used as a coffee substitute. Um, the flower petals um, are made uh, into wine and into syrup. It makes a beautiful syrup when, uh, when it's um, steeped in honey. And the um leaves the dandelion leaves um when they're small are used as um, a salad green in europe they have they grow dandelion uh that's quite domesticated and the leaves are uh about eight inches tall and they're one of the european bitter greens um kind of like uh um guy lamb would be for an asian green um, so the dandelion is actually um, very useful in a lot of ways. So just to get back to what we were just asked, the abbreviation oh, yes, SP sorry. is used when the actual specific name cannot or need not be specified. So in other words, if there's only one plant in the genus, you can use SP. If there's more than one plant in the in the in the genus, you're going to use the plural form, which is SPP. Sounds Who like knew? A, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, like, sounds like a, a giant puzzle, doesn't it? I yeah. I find it fascinating. I do. I, I I'm really having fun with this, and I know when Richard asked me that I want what I wanted to do, he was kind of like, "You want to talk about Latin names?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> You've tapped into a really geeky part of people's gardening personalities. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you know, you know, Jane, you made a really great comment about the, the tags and, uh, you know, the mature um, height and whatnot. And I know uh, I knew someone that just fell in love with this beautiful conifer. And, and look, it's it's only 10 feet at 10 years. And I said, yeah, and then it's a teenager and it will be 150 feet. So get yourself a dwarf variety, get yourself a nano, right? But don't, but don't use that. And, and that's really where the, the names, the um, specific names become pretty important. Very my important. My Very presentation. Important. Morally, more, mostly for size in a lot of these cases, especially when yeah. you're dealing with large trees. Yeah. Yeah. My talk in uh, August will be on small trees and everything else, small trees, uh, shrubs, and stuff for urban gardens. Wonderful! Oh, I I won't miss it because I'm having the the arborist is coming tomorrow with the chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs>
I have some very old, I'm on a very, very old property we, we're rejuvenating and I have like some very dying California, the San, Sianothus lilacs that are dying. They actually only have a lifespan of about 30 years old. And uh, oh, really? Plants, yeah, and these ones near as I can figure are about 65 years old. And then I have a huge big leaf maple that's got to come down. He's uh, the previous owners decided to give him some head cuts and now all of his vascular system has been compromised. And so oh, uh, right, right. the chainsaw the is coming out tomorrow and I'm lovely, happily getting arborist wood chips out of it. So I'm a happy girl. Right. <laughs> um, so the Ceanothus is really not a very long lived shrub then. No, it's very short lived shrub actually. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and it just gets beautiful and then it starts to decline. It just, yeah. I know we have we have one here that was declining and I couldn't see where the way it was treated was the cause but it's, it's about not. it's about 30 years old so yeah, it's just age. Yeah. Do, oh, don't talk about that. We don't use the a <laughs> word here. We don't we don't use the a word. <laughs> we don't call we don't talk about the a word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, please not. <laughs> I'm not seeing any more questions. Do you have any final remarks, Jane? I just want you guys to go out and garden and have fun wherever you are. Thank you for um, joining me in this presentation. And I hope it's kind of, um, you know, spurred you on to research a little bit more of what you're doing at your local nursery. Bring out your phone, check out every plant. Plants are too damned expensive to have failures anymore. So um, I'm cheap. Okay. I, I like to call myself frugal. Um, and I don't want to waste my money on plants that aren't going to do well in the area in which I want them to grow. Great. Thank you so much to Jane and to Joe and Richard for uh, creating a lively discussion at the end and helping answer all your questions as we went along, which was wonderful. Thank you for having me. Thank you.